Well, today we are going to return <clears throat> to our study in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we're not actually going to read anything from 1 Peter chapter 2 today, but we are in 1 Peter chapter 2. <laughs> uh, in today's study, we're going to expand on the subject matter that we looked at last over the last couple of weeks from uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17, and Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. We are once again going to be focusing our attention on the subject of civil authorities, and specifically we're going to be talking about resisting civil authorities. Now, it will more than likely take three weeks to cover this material. And as I mentioned last week, I am choosing <clears throat> to call this part of our study resisting civil authorities rather than the phrase that you typically hear, civil disobedience. And I'm doing this for reasons that I stated last week. And that was a commercial for last week's teaching. If you were not here, please do go online and get a and make sure that you listen to that. But one truth from last week that I am going to repeat, and that is this. We need to remember that as God's people, our mission as the people of God, our mission as the church takes precedence over every other agenda in the world. The mission of the church is preeminent God could place us in situations that require us to resist civil authorities. Throughout the course of history, the mission of God's people has often conflicted, brought them into conflict with civil authorities, and we're going to see that today. And while we are to be in subjection to civil authorities, as we've already talked about, two, for two weeks we've talked about that, there are times then that we may need to resist rather than submit. And this reality will become very important as we explore many examples of civil resistance in the Bible. We're going to see that there are different types of civil resistance. There are times when the resistance needs to be firm Sometimes it doesn't need to be firm. There are things that civil authorities may demand from us that they have no authority to demand from us. There's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 12, that says it is an abomination for kings to commit wicked acts. For a throne, <coughs> excuse me, a throne is established on righteousness. <coughs> Sometimes they cross that line. I also mentioned last week that it is, it is not even possible for me to cross every T and dot every I because there are so many ways in which Christians have historically resisted the powers that be. The majority of examples that we are going to study are from the pages of Scripture. I may throw in a contemporary example or two, but I am most interested in looking to the scriptures for guidance on this subject and to the examples of God's people that we read about in the Bible. Now, the scriptures contain a variety of a variety of examples of civil resistance. Now, there are no specific categories given to these varieties, and so I had to make up I had to make up my own titles based upon the examples that we see in Scripture. Here are the titles that I've chosen to give these categories of civil resistance. These are the ones that we are going to examine. First of all, we're going to talk about full resistance. I'll explain what these mean later. Full resistance. Then there is another kind of resistance that I would call respectful resistance. There's passive resistance. Then we're going to talk about holding civil authorities accountable. And we're going to couple that with what I call the prophetic voice. And lastly, we're going to talk about citizen rights. The rights of citizens. The scriptures actually contain examples of each one of these, as we're going to see. 
So, you're ready to begin? Here we go. Let's begin by talking about full resistance. Full resistance. Now, by the phrase full resistance, I am referring to a situation when the civil authorities make a law or a set of laws or a set of standards and the enforcement of those laws, those standards on the citizenry would cause God's people, would cause Christians to be disobedient to God or cause believers to compromise their faith in some way, shape, or form. In other words, if that set of standards was enforced, it would mean we would have to sin against God or we would have to compromise our faith. And so we would perhaps need to engage in full resistance. Now I'm starting with full resistance because it is perhaps the most talked about form of civil resistance. The first example that we're going to look at, <coughs> excuse me, of full resistance is what I'm going to refer to as low hanging fruit. In other words, it's a real obvious example where civil resistance was necessary and the reason for the resistance is very, very evident. And we're going to turn to Daniel chapter three. <clears throat> Could you guess that that might be where we go? <clears throat> Daniel chapter three. Now, if you're a Christian, you're probably familiar with this situation. And what I want us to do is I want us to read through this. We're going to read through all of the examples because it's important to see how things unfold. It's important to watch the process that led to a child of God, the people of God to say, sorry, we can't do that. Now, in Daniel chapter three, we want to remember that the Jewish people at this point are in Babylonian captivity. They are prisoners of war. For all practical purposes, they belong to somebody else. They are in a foreign land. Through the prophet Jeremiah, Israel was told how they were to occupy during their time in Babylon. And here's what it says in Jeremiah chapter 29. Now, these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Listen to this. <clears throat> the letter was sent by the hand of, Elis of uh, Elisa, the son of Shaphim, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I, whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat their produce. Take wives and become fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives of your, uh, for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease." Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will have welfare. That's interesting. So Jeremiah 29 provides a very good backdrop to help us understand the social and the political constraints that Israel was exposed to by the time you get to Daniel chapter three. Now, Many of the captives did very well during this time. God's favor was upon the children of Israel while they were in captivity, at least the obedient ones. And some of the children of Israel actually rose up within the ranks of servitude to become very important people within the Babylonian government of all things. Now we look to Daniel chapter three, beginning to read verse one. By the way, we're going to read fast, so get ready. <laughs> I want to make sure I've got my timer set here. Okay, I do. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits and its width six cubits, and he set it up 
on a plain, in, on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges and the magistrates and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that king, the, uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps and the prefects and the governors and all of those other guys were, <laughs> yes, I may throw one of those in once in a while, <laughs> were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, trigon, I'm not sure I pronounced that, psaltery, bagpipe, and all the kinds of music, music you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whosoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound <coughs> of all of those instruments <coughs> with all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. <clears throat> so here, Nebuchadnezzar, as pagan leaders were prone to, is just really full of himself. He really is. He wanted everyone to get on board with this agenda. And so when the music plays, everyone is supposed to bow. Pretty simple. Verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans, 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 came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of all those instruments is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of of a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration. So these are Jews that had risen up within the ranks, whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. So these Jews, who were captives, but rose to prominent positions of leadership in Babylon, these individuals were not complying with the king's edict. They were really in a very volatile situation, keeping in mind these were captives, and they're not, they're not conforming to this agenda. Well, then Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and anger, verse 13, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the instruments, <laughs> fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Words very similar to Sennacherib. Plenty of world leaders have made the similar mistake of basically challenging God. What God is going to deliver you from me? Look at who I am. You know who I am? Now, interestingly, Nebuchadnezzar here is actually giving them a chance to recant. Keep in mind that these are good men in his cabinet. They have so far served Nebuchadnezzar faithfully. They're not scoundrels like so many of the other men who were serving in cabinet position. But that's not enough. Nebuchadnezzar wants them to bow. 
Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, <coughs> excuse me, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have, that you have set up. These are very sobering words. They are not going, <coughs> they're not going to budge. Now, don't think that they didn't have butterflies in their stomach. Just because they had courage doesn't mean that they were immune to the emotions that can take place in a person's heart when they're confronted with, with something like this. Even the spotless son of God experienced intense grief as he prepared to offer himself by yielding to the powers that be. We read that in the Gospels. But these men were resolute. Nebuchadnezzar's response, <laughs> well, he just pops a cork. <laughs> look, at, look at verse 19. <clears throat> then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Suddenly his countenance changed. Everything changed. These men that had served him so well he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He is enraged. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie them up in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, caps, and other clothes, and they were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. <clears throat> For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of fire slew those men who carried them up and threw them in. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Can you imagine that? You're bound, woo, tossed in. <clears throat> then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded. And stood up in haste and said to his high officials, Was it not three that we cast bound to the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. And by the way, that's why their name is mentioned over and over. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're making, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is making sure we have a paper trail. No one was lost in this. Their names are given each time not to be monotonous. But because there's a paper trail here. We're, we're following something that the Spirit is showing us. We're seeing consistency. That's what the Bible repeats things and we reread re -read it and go, oh no. Why does it have to repeat this over and over again? <clears throat> it's just showing how the scripture is reliable by doing that. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire and he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. <laughs> and they did. They came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on, their bod on the bodies of these men, nor was their, the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. What? <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, his own command, and yielding up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue <clears throat> that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <laughs> shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. So we can see here, <clears throat> they threw these men into the fire 
he looks down and he sees four men loosed walking about in the midst of the fire. And of course, I skipped over the part where it says the appearance of the fourth was like, <clears throat> Nasby says the son of the gods. King James says son of God. We are to assume that Jesus was actually in there with them and delivers them from the fire. No smoke, no nothing on them, <clears throat> no singed clothing. And by the end of it all, Nebuchadnezzar is so blown away that he himself makes a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of the three Hebrews will be torn limb from limb. I wish our president would say something like this. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? If he got, stood in the White House and said, anybody who speaks against Yahweh. <clears throat> and then it says, verse 30, that the king caused... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. So this had a very happy ending for the people of God. But we see an example of full resistance. The command was given. The Hebrew children said, the Hebrew men said, no, we are not going to bow. We are not going to yield to your idolatrous agenda. But part of what I wanted you to see and the reason why we read through this and I didn't just say, remember the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is because it's good to see the example of all of the political machinations that are involved. The process that led up to this and what happened afterwards. Now, I want to look at another example of full resistance and this one has a little bit of a different twist. There's more political maneuvering involved. I want us to see that not all examples of civil resistance, not all examples of full resistance are cookie cutter examples. The, the details can be quite diverse. The good news is you don't have to go very far. You can flip to the right to Daniel chapter six. We have to read this one too because of the variation in the details compared to the first example. <clears throat> I know that this is a, this is a very well-known example of civil resistance, but it certainly is worth reading through. Daniel chapter six, beginning to read verse one. I need to take a sip of water. I keep clearing my throat. <clears throat> Daniel six, verse one. It seemed good to Darius. So now we have a new king, Darius. We have a new kingdom that's in charge, the Medes and the Persians. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them, three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. We think of Joseph, right? <clears throat> then the commissioners and the satraps began to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. So in other words, Daniel is doing his job and he's doing it real well. Then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Here's how we can snag this guy. So <clears throat> let's try and grasp here just how conniving they are. Let's watch the wheels of politics roll. Now I'm going to really hold back from commenting a lot, but it's hard to miss the extraordinary similarities that we see here with the political lobbying and posturing to vilify Christian ethics and morals today. It's hard not to see it. So we read, continuing in verse six, 
<clears throat> then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statue and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. They knew what they were doing. Then King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. So what we have here, folks, is a very urgent appeal to the king's ego. They appeal to the king's ego, but then they say, let's get this codified into law very quickly, O king, for your glory. And why wouldn't he go along with it? And the things becomes codified into law. Now he, of course, is oblivious as to their real motive. The irony is, is they're not even doing this for him. They are actually being worse servants to the king than Daniel is. Daniel wouldn't lie like this. Daniel wouldn't come up with a, with a manipulative plan like this. Remember I said a couple of weeks ago that the people of God are actually the best citizens to have at your side. A civil, uh, the civil authorities should be blessed to have Christians at their side. But here we see the wheels are in motion. <clears throat> when politics are involved, we can be sure that politics are eventually going to try to roll right over religion. How is Daniel going to react? Well, now it's codified into law. Does Daniel, is Daniel aware of this? Well, of course he is. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. So we can see here that the details between this and the last story are a little different. Daniel's resistance is deliberate, but he is simply doing what he has always done. He is not going to give up his routine of seeking God. Could he have altered his routine to be a little less obvious? Why would he? Charles Spurgeon had a comment on this. <clears throat> He said, I greatly admire one feature in Daniel's decision. He did not alter his accustomed habit in any single, single particular. Without guise and without parade, he pursued the even tenor of his way. As we have already said, the time <clears throat> was the same. The attitude was the same. The open window was the same. There was no precaution whatever to conceal the fact that he was going to pray or to equivocate in the act when he was praying. He does not appear to have taken counsel with his friends or to have summoned his servants and charged them not to let any intruder come in. Neither did he adopt any measure to escape his enemies. Not one jot of anxiety did he betray. His faith was steadfast, his composure unruffled, his conduct simple and artless, end quote. I like that. He just said, um, he continued on with what he would normally do. <clears throat> well, the wheels just keep rolling. The political machine keeps rolling. Verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God, before his God as, he, as they knew he would. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any God or a man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, the statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. See, there's the catch. They knew that <clears throat> before they had him sign it. 
Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah. See, they point to the fact, remember, he's one of those guys, not a national born Mede, Persian, but one of those captives. He pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you sign, but keeps making his petition three times a day. You see the disrespect here, king? This man is just blowing off your edict. And he's supposed to be the guy that you want to put over everything. Well, verse 14, then as soon as the king heard the statement, <clears throat> he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until the sunset, he, sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, recognize, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statue which the king establishes may be changed. The king loved Daniel, and if he could have gotten Daniel out of the situation, he would have, but he was bound by his own signature. He signed it in, into law. Daniel had to pay the price. Even though Daniel was more reliable to the king than any of these men. No question about it. The king knew he was bound. Verse 16, that the king gave orders. You guys know this story. And Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. Interesting statement. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing could be changed in regard to Daniel, much to his dismay. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought in before him. He didn't watch Netflix that night. <clears throat> his sleep fled from him. <laughs> then the king arose at dawn at the break of day and he went in haste to the lion's den. He just had to go see what was going to happen. And when he had come near to the den, near the den to, to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. I mean, he created them after all. <clears throat> and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also toward you, O king, I've committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and he gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den. No injury whatsoever was found on him because he trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders and brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel. Ouch. And they cast them, their children, and wives into the lion's den. And they had not even reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Oh my. This is a brutal scene. No doubt the Lord is, is stoking those lions, making them even more fierce. Then Darius the king wrote to all the people, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, <clears throat> may your peace abound. And I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is a living God and enduring forever and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who also has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And so this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So Daniel's legacy lived on until he died. But once again, we see that God intervened and rescued his servant because Daniel trusted in him and obeyed God more than man. So here we have another happy ending. But the outcome of civil resistance does not always lead to a happy ending. In the temporal, it doesn't always lead to a happy ending. There are all, obviously, there's, a, there's an eternal blessing to be derived. But what I want to look at before we wind things down today is I want to look at one example of... <clears throat> of full resistance, this time from the New Testament. And I'm going to abbreviate this a little bit to kind of move us along. But I want us to turn to Acts chapter 4. 
Acts chapter 4. And you probably could have guessed that I was going to go here as well. And we are looking at more examples of full resistance than we will be looking at the other types of resistance. Acts chapter 4. Now, the story for this begins in Acts chapter 3 with the healing of a beggar. This is followed by a sermon from Peter directed toward the Jews in the temple precinct. So ministry is happening. Evangelism is taking place. Then, chapter 4, verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid their hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of them came to be about 5,000. So this, is, this message is having a lot of influence on the masses. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and, and all who were of high priestly descent. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man was made well, let it be known <clears throat> unto all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you have crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that was given among men by which we must be saved. Well, that's one of the main verses of this chapter right there, verse 12. But here we see that the temple powers that be those who officiate in the temple region, the temple vicinity, move in to try to stop what's going on. Ironically, this is the same religious group that went after Jesus. Now they're going after his disciples. And what I want us to note here is the involvement of these civil authorities. Now there's no intervention yet from the Roman authorities. Remember that the Jews were permitted to handle legal matters within their own ranks. For capital punishment, they needed permission. But this is a legal matter for them. They had, albeit limited, they had control over the temple area. And they were feeling threatened by this band of Jewish misfits who were talking about this Jesus guy that he just accused them of being responsible for having put him to death. So there's a lot going on here. Try to, try to absorb the dynamic. They're coming after these guys. These guys were <clears throat> politically threatening to them. The disciples were. Notice verse 13. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer one with another, saying, what are we going to do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they command them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, 
Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now there's the punchline right there. There's the resistance. We are not going to do that. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them. They let them go on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. They knew that it would cause too much trouble. So they're trying to like, just let them slide out the back door. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle had been, this miracle of healing had been performed. And when they had been released, they went to their companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And basically what happened after that was they had a prayer meeting. So God's spirit continued to move on the believers. And then they began to give to one another. And then Ananias and Sapphira were slain in the spirit, literally, right after this. <laughs> Healing miracles were taking place. And so all this is going on, and here comes the civil authorities again to resist the people of God. So all this activity is going on, just like in chapter 3. Chapter 5, we'll just read a few verses here in chapter 5. Look at verse 17. But the high priest rose up along with all his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid their hands on the apostles and they put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, taking them out. And he said, go and stand, <clears throat> go stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. So he's basically telling them to go disobey the civil authorities. Interesting. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the senate and the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison. And they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely, and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened it up, we didn't find anyone inside. <clears throat> Boy, oh boy, they're just violating civil authorities all over the place here. They didn't go and turn themselves in either, by the way. Now, when the captain of the temple guard, the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them saying, the men whom you put in the prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. And when they brought them, they stood them before the council, <coughs> excuse me, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us, which, by the way, already was upon them. But Peter and the apostles answers, we must obey God rather than men. This goes back to what I said earlier. The agenda of the church takes precedence over every other agenda. And God is confirming this. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and as a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Well, then Gamaliel, the teacher, uh, uh, teacher of the law, he steps in. He gives wise counsel. They took his counsel. <clears throat> but verse 40, jumping ahead, says they took his advice and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then release them. And so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching, preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now, here's an interesting question. Knowing conflict awaited them, why did they keep, why did they go back to the temple area? I mean, why go back to the place where trouble is waiting for them? Why not go somewhere else? 
because they're following the Lord's command. Jesus told them in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Well, the temple was the most prominent place for them to be in Jerusalem. They were still attending the times of prayer. Lots of religious activity was going on in and around the temple. And the highest concentration of Jewish people would be there in Jerusalem, especially around the temple. So the temple was right where they were supposed to be. Interestingly, in the context of civil resistance, Jesus said this to his disciples. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But be aware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Full resistance by these individuals. Now here's a closing little tidbit. Hebrews chapter 11 is sometimes referred to as the hall of faith. Numerous examples of God's people who exhibited faith in God. I want you to count the number of examples of faith that are in that chapter that were acts of civil resistance and that's why they made it into the hall of faith. I counted at least five Check it out for yourself. And by the way, we only scratched the surface of full resistance. We didn't even talk about the Hebrew midwives of Exodus 1, the parents of Moses in Exodus 2, Elijah in 1 Kings 18, Mordecai in Esther chapter 3, Esther in Esther chapter 4, Jeremiah in Jeremiah 38, and the wise men of Matthew chapter 2, and on and on it could go with examples of full resistance. We obey God above man. That is the lesson in full resistance. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. We have a lot more to come. And I mean a lot. So, we have to be diligent not to allow our fear of man to hold us back and to keep us from doing what God has commanded us to do. You know, it's easy to see, be brave, we've got to obey God more than man. It's easy to say that and maybe even think that right now because my life isn't being threatened at the moment. But it is a little different when you're standing before a fiery furnace. So we have to appreciate the fact that <clears throat> these men, yes, stood courageously, but we have to always remember that it's only by the strength of God that we can even do such a thing. And we have to pray, God, please help me to serve you and to love you more than I love man. It's hard to do. Or help me to fear you more than I fear the powers that be. It's hard to do when the powers that be are breathing down your neck. Nevertheless, Lord, we do pray that you would indeed help us to be humble and yet bold. Lord, to be wise as serpents and yet to be gentle as doves. Lord, we saw in these examples <clears throat> in the three Hebrew children, Lord, we saw examples of great courage in them and Daniel, full resistance on their behalf. And yet they were blameless in the eyes of, of the civil authorities that they served. The disciples, a little bit different situation. Lord, they were just simply involved in the mission that you had called them to be involved in. Evangelizing. Spreading the, the news of the gospel. And Father, we know that our mission that you have us on is oftentimes going to bring us into direct conflict. And we pray that you would help us, Father God, to first of all, know what our mission is, and secondly, to be obedient to you, regardless of the cost. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for these examples, Lord, and we thank you that we can hold fast to you, Lord, because your word shows us exactly what to do. Father in heaven, bless our time of fellowship right now. Bless our food downstairs. And we just thank you, God, for being present here right now with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.